one at a time, or right? I see. See, it's me making the camera. And I think you No, you have to go What the? It's our hardest right? So it's worth mine. Ha ha, that's right. <laughs> that you all are here for this weird and wonderful adventure into our collective imaginations. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Rhonda for the wonderful introduction and assistance, support, all of the library for inviting us to be a part of Pub Night. We'd also like to thank our grantors who include the College of Communication and Fine Arts, mm -hmm. through which we were able to purchase the technology you'll hear about tonight, the RAINS Research Assistant Program, through which Christine started working on this project, and also, as Rhonda mentioned, the Association, um, the American Association for University Women. I'd like to thank the students who participated in our workshop, at least one of whom is here tonight to tell you about their experience. And we are really thrilled when we have the opportunity to collaborate and increase our learning in uh, workshop and rehearsal spaces. But most of all, I'd like to thank you for coming because you will have an opportunity to test the technology with us tonight and take this project further. So a preview of our evening is I'll be sharing a little bit about the origin, the genesis of this project. We'll talk a bit about the workshop, where what we discovered together creatively, and then we'll move into a Q&A, an opportunity to test the technology together. Before we begin, because this is a project about our senses and our sensory experience, Amber taught me a five-cent check-in. So we're gonna take a moment and ground together. So the first one, Amber, we're gonna try to check in with five things we can see in the room. So to ground ourselves, take a look about the space and notice five things that you can see that are of interest to you. And then four things, Amber, that we can touch. So maybe you're touching some food, the seat below you, the feeling of the cool air from the AC on your skin. Some cozy pants. <laughs> Three things that we can hear. Three things you can hear in the room. The buzzing, the chewing, the breathing. Two things that you can smell. And one thing maybe that you taste. Sodexo for the tastes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and as mentioned, we encourage uh, an informal atmosphere, so please feel free to get up as you need and come and go as your schedule permits. Alrighty, Rue. Friends, it's time. It's time. <laughs> Let's go. <sighs> it's been a long time. It's been a long pandemic. <laughs> as a theater artist, uh, 2020 was really hard. The world as I knew it, but the work as I knew it, changed completely. And as a communicative, collaborative artist, I was really curious about how I could take my broken heart and turn it into art when live theater and performance as I knew it had changed. And so sitting at home, I wondered, I started to wonder about how my experience was shifting as a human being, my sense of touch, my proximity to other bodies. I got really good at learning what six feet felt like. <laughs> so I wondered about how the pandemic has affected my sensory experience, but yours as well. 
I also spent a lot of time, like many of you, on screens and came to think about technology-mediated presence um, and how that's evolving our communication and our sense of interbeing. And the Instagram algorithm found me in the pandemic <laughs> and introduced me to a very cool new technology by a company called Playtronica which has, uh, to this point, been shared in art and design and marketing circles, but not yet, truly, in theater. So we had an opportunity uh, to dive in and make some discoveries. So here we go. Let's talk about the technology that we discovered upon which this project is based. So Playtronica is a Russian and German-based design company created in 2014. Started in musical education, um, inventing instruments from everyday life. Their goal is to model the synergy between the physical and digital worlds thanks to the power of sound and touch. Come on in. So Playtronica explores and arouses curiosity by using music, play, and creative opportunities. With a simple human touch, objects turn into sound. If you're like me, that didn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> so let's take a closer look. Playtronica has three devices, the first of which is called Touch Me. This is a smart textile. Can you hold it up for us? Yes. Very small, it's about $80, $90, depending on the value of the euro. <laughs> and using this little device and a few cords, we can create a conductive circuit and turn the touch between two people into musical notes and sound. Let's take a look. conductive object. So when we touch, for example, these flowers, we will hear the flowers. deliberate choice to use technology to mix our senses. Let's learn a little bit more. There are many kinds of synesthesia. I have to read this definition. Synesthesia is a perceptual phenomenon, a neurological condition in which when we stimulate one sensory or cognitive pathway, there is an involuntary expression or experience in another sensory or cognitive pathway. So for example, in this image, this artist listened to the song Lucky by Radiohead, and their version of synesthesia interprets music as color. Mm. 
Christine happened to be my RAINS research assistant um, during the period that I came to know this technology and happened to have synesthesia. And when that kind of nudge comes from the divine, Kathy, <laughs> would you tell us about your version of synesthesia? Stacy always wants me to. I'm, I'm so sorry to disappoint you. It's a very boring kind. <laughs> um, I see numbers as colors. So um, for me, all numbers are associated with very specific shades of color. <laughs> I'm curious if anyone else in the room has synesthesia. Actually, I have a question. Could you give us an example? Yes, four is um, dark green, and two is like navy blue, three is red. Um, they tend to go like that. If whatever it starts, anything in the 30s tends to be in the red shades. So it goes like that up. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Could I give you a number and you decide? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So if I said like uh, 40,300. Oh it's in the fours, it's still green. It's just, you. yeah, it kind of trails off. Yeah. <laughs> I told you, it's not very interesting. <laughs> it's actually fascinating. No. Sorry. <laughs> so Christine and others are known as synesthetics. Three to five percent of the population, and there are 60 to 80 known subtypes knocks my socks off. So for example, someone could, what's the one we found earlier? Someone could taste words. <laughs> That's the one I want. <laughs> so some folks that you may be familiar with and did not know that they were synesthetes include Billie Eilish, Pharrell, Van Gogh, Nabokov, I think I said that right, yeah. Nabokov, and of course Queen Bee, Beyonce. <laughs> so one of the premises here, I think, is that neurological differences can be strengths. People who are wired differently allow us to see the world, experience the world in different ways, and so working on this project has made me value differences in perception. Even more. Alrighty. Don't escape, have I? Here we go. Alright, now that we've talked a little bit about synesthesia, let's talk about our project, oh, Christine. Let's talk. Alright. Um, what up, everybody? I'm Christine. Brian. Um, whoa. So I was a grad student here at the time of this. Um, Project. When did we do this? 2021, which was the um, year that I graduated. And now I teach at LMU. I'm the um, movement instructor for the theater school, and I also teach beginning acting. Um, yeah, and I'm a hardcore theater guy. Here's the cool thing about theater that I love. It is a team sport. It is a collaborative form. And so our research, we like to do together. And the favorite thing that we'll say when we have a great idea is we'll go, Let's do a workshop. <laughs> we love a workshop. Um, workshops can mean different things in theater. Sometimes it just means a production that we're going to try out without reviewers coming to, you know, say that didn't work. We're like, no, it's a workshop. Um, but it's also a great way where we develop new techniques. We try different theories out. We blend theory. We take things and we see if it has value. Does it work? Um, in theater, because it's a team sport, we have to figure that out with groups of people because everybody creates differently. And so when Stacy brought this idea, the first thing we said is, let's do a workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we gathered a group of amazing students. Um, I enlisted five brave volunteers from my Movement for Actors a class that I was teaching. These were students from the School of Theater. They were theater majors. Um, and had been exploring with me all sorts of ways that we can use movement, human movement to communicate story, to create character, to engage with the spaces around us, to engage our senses in different ways. And so I thought this is a great group of students to bring to this project. And we also invited um, one unbelievable graduate volunteer, Amber Bryce, um, who will introduce herself and her thesis in a minute, but who's very interested in the use of the senses in theater training and theater education. And so what a dream team it was. Um, we were interested in a lot of different applications. My um, thesis was in trauma-sensitive 
theater pedagogy specifying really around movement training. And you know, when you're researching trauma and how that shows up in the classroom, how that engages with movement, with the human body, touch comes up a lot. So thinking about um, what's the role of touch in a movement classroom, um, what are ways we can reframe touch, what are ways we can get, engage with touch in the classroom in a way that feels um, safe and comfortable within our boundaries was something that was really interesting to me. Um, we were also interested in it as a tool not just for education but also perhaps for theater making. So are there moments in production, in storytelling, where this technology could be used when Romeo and Juliet go palm to palm, could that create a sound? Um, if you're doing a devised work, um, which is just a fancy word for a bunch of theater people in a room yelling ideas at each other until a play <laughs> happens, um, could you incorporate some of this technology to create moments, to create writing, to create a, an interactive theater piece where perhaps an audience member would touch an object and a sound would be made. So we were interested in really all applications of this work, um, but rather than just sitting and dreaming it up by ourselves, we thought let's get a group of creative people together in a room and see what happens because we know that you know they'll take it far beyond what we could. So that's what we did. Um, now Stacy and I are both wonderful, brilliant theater <laughs> artists. Yeah. We're not so good at the technology, <laughs> but we knew someone who was. <laughs> and I can introduce him with a video, the man, the legend. Here we go. <laughs> So what happened next was, um, so actually can I see the, the touch maker first? I'm going to speak a little bit about the actual technology. Um, when I came to this project, um, Stacy had these devices, right? You can see on the screen the touch me is the one at the top there, that's this one, right? That's the one I was playing in the video. And the way the touch me and the Playtron work is they're MIDI devices. Anybody know what MIDI stands for? What are you talking about? Anybody? So it's a musical instrument, a digital interface, right? Um, so what that, what the sounds you're hearing, right, when you're hearing someone touching the flowers or whatnot, is actually this device connecting to a computer. It's connecting to a synthesizer, right? There's different synthesizers that you can choose from that Playtron is set up, right? So that's how we're getting the actual sound. The way it works, I'm trying to just explain it in a way that's not super boring. Um, the way that it works is your body can conduct electricity, right? Your body can conduct a circuit, right? Can complete a circuit, right? So the copper on the touch me has two sides, and when both sides are touched and it's connected to a computer, the intensity with which you touch it and you know the movement you touch it with creates the sound um, in the synthesizer, right? Um, the touch me also has some buttons on the top that can change the key or the scale. So one of the things I discovered is as soon as I figured that out, I figured I could put it in a certain key and I could put it in a blue scale and I could put a backing track on and then I could just play along with it like you saw in that video, right? Once, wow. you, once you got that far, you feel like you can use it that way, right? So that's kind of how the, uh, the touch me works, right? Um, and it, it's part of the mission statement of Playtronica is music for everybody, right? So if you don't know how to play music, you, can, you know how to touch, right? And if you can, you know, make, uh, you know, if you can touch this device, you can make music, right? Um, so the and the Playtron, is the Playtron next? Playtron. I'll discuss this. Oh yeah, yeah. You can pass it around. You guys can all check it out. Um, the Playtron works in a similar fashion, except for it has all these. You can see all these little holes that are all over it, right? Um, that's so, the, there, if you look closely, we'll pass it around so you can see, each one of these is connected to a musical note, C, C sharp, et cetera, right? And so you can hook those up to something that conducts electricity, right? This is what we talk about, fruit, everybody. 
apple, a potato, those kind of things conduct electricity. So what folks were doing with this, and there's some insane videos out there, people check it out, <laughs> people playing watermelons and like a piano, right? It's really fun stuff. Um, yeah, pineapples, it's, it's all kinds of madness. Um, this is how the plate drum works in a similar way, right? Instead of using your hands to touch, right? you can use another piece of fruit or anything that can conduct electricity or can complete a circuit. Right? You can use water itself. You can put some in a Water is an amazing one with the, with the uh, touch me. It's with one hand and then if you push your hands in the water like that, it will make sound depending on the, the waves and how you're touching the water. Um, but one of the interesting things about the, uh, the so we've, our, our next step was to figure out how we were going to use these in a workshop. Speaking of the workshop in our three phases. Yeah. Can you tell us what Orbita too? That last it's this one. one. This, okay. Yeah. What I can tell you is this one hasn't come out yet. And nobody really knows what it does, right? <laughs> it's, it's, color color the, it it, it's color to sound. Oh, right. So this is Whoa. a Orbita. 2020. 2023 is coming out this three. year. And what you can imagine is it spins like a record player and the place that you put uh, those little dots determine where and when the music comes. Right. Yeah. Sounds awesome. We yeah. are excited for us to get one. <laughs> um, so, in any case, now I'm going to skip ahead now to the next thing. Let's, yeah, let's do this. What did we do? Okay, great. So what we did, how we were figuring this out. This is our next step. When we got together and talked about this, we were trying to decide how do we use this technology in theater or in movement or in a device space. And we kind of came up with three ideas or three phases of what we were going to try. Right, and so the first one was using the touch me, and we thought we would pair up the actors in, into groups, and we got from the library, because we weren't in the business of having cables running all over the room, some iPads that had the synths on them that could make the noise. So it was like an iPad on like a shoulder holster, right? And then connected to the touch me, and then each pair um, of students had a time to work on a scene, to tell a story with no dialogue, Right, with nothing written, nothing planned out, just using the touch me, or you touch your hands together like you saw in the video. Uh, you could move around the room. Everybody took some time to work on that in groups, and then we presented those and we watched those and we talked about what they learned, how they were telling a story, beginning, middle, end, just using sound and just using um, the touch me device. That was phase one. Um, phase two was with the Playtronica, um, or the Playtron. And phase two was, we realized so we weren't going to use apples or watermelons, right? <laughs> we had to figure out something that would conduct electricity that we could use to, um, oh yes, pass it around so you can see how it works there. You can see it's labeled on the back, so we had to label circuits and run it to, um, run it into a computer so we had an interface. So the idea with phase two was we had all the participants um, record themselves at home talking about their time during the pandemic, what their experience was, right? How it made them feel, how they, how they dealt with the isolation, um, et cetera. So everybody had sent those recordings into us. We set them up in a uh, program. And then what we used in the room were cookie sheets, metal cookie sheets, because they are a conductor, right? Metal's a conductor. We set the sheets up in the room in various stations and then ran circuits back to the computer and a speaker, right? And each different cookie sheet, when you stepped on it with your bare feet, right? Because you had to make that circuit. You had to hold the Playtronica of one hand and step on the circuit to complete it. And then you would you would hear, it sounds so weird explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. It's, it's really like a porky. Porky. It is. It's a port key. That's it. Harry Stacey Potter always folks? Yes. Like a port key. Yes. Yeah. It, it, yes. Transports it transports you to that, right? <laughs> Um, so what we were interested in learning was when, and it was set up randomly, right? What would happen when somebody stepped on one of those sheets and heard the voice of another student in the room or themselves, right? And one of the things we've been discussing a little bit in our group is that we talk about in theater, one of the things that we love and the thing that we're chasing is when the room changes, right? Everything, like we say good theater is when the room changes. When you're in the room and you know it, if you've been to a good show, you know when it happens. You know when everybody in the room kind of changes. When the room changes, you feel it, right? And so that was our interest to see if something like that can happen. And it happened almost immediately. And I'm gonna let Amber talk about that a little bit because um, 
because you were the, the person that happened with right away. And the room definitely changed, and we all felt it, and it was fascinating and, and super interesting. Um, and it's the kind of thing, I think it, was, it clicked for us in a way that this is a way that something that's exciting about theater and about something live and something unexpected. Mm -hmm. One of the things we love about theater is not knowing what's com coming next. You know, the unexpected is a big part of it. So then phase three, our last phase, which you're going to get to participate in a little bit tonight, is we created kind of a pandemic sculpture, that's what we're calling it. Um, it's behind you and on the tables in the back of the room, where there are objects. We had the participants um, send us, we, they filled out a questionnaire and talked about what objects um, they associated with the pandemic. And sounds that they And sounds that they yeah. associated with, you know, what sounds that they could think of. And then we tried to tie those objects to sounds. And the way the sculpture works is much like the, the touch me with the Playtron. There's a device you hold for us in this room. It's a little metal bowl that you hold in one hand. And when you touch the copper element on one of the objects, a sound will play that we've associated with that um, object. Now, you can also, because our bodies conduct electricity, when we had the participants walk through the room, sometimes they could, three people in a row could hold hands as long as one person was holding the object and then the third person wrote touch the object and they could feel and hear what that was happening together as they were going through it, right? Which is really interesting and fascinating to watch because as you will see when we're done and after questions, everybody's gonna get a chance to use it. There are certain sounds that were very comforting. Um, certain sounds were very uncomfortable. There were pe people that wanted to hear something again and again. There were people that would hear a little bit of a sound and not want to hear it ever again, <laughs> right? Um, so it was. It ended up being a really fascinating look at how we then associate these objects with sounds, right? You know, and sounds with sound memory much. and experience. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was our. That was that day we spent. That was our our project, our experiment with those three phases we went through, and then. You know, we obviously, we took video, we circled back, talked, we created this kind of process out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about what we found. Let's talk about it. Can I go into this? Let's start us off. Is that me? Yeah, it's you. What did I find? You? Click right. <laughs> I don't know anything about the slide. What did I find? Oh, ah, <laughs> lava. Yes. Oh, it's yes, here. I'll, tell, right. I'll tell you about lava. So, um, one of the things I do um, as a movement artist is um, I do a lot of work with um, Lava on any lava on folks in the room? Any of my dance friends are? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, all right. Okay, so I'm like a month away from my CMA, um, which is my I'm a certified movement analyst. Thank you. I will be very soon. Um, in lava on movement, um, lava on movement analysis. It's a way of dividing, of really analyzing and um, articulating what we see in human movement. Very useful as a movement teacher. One of the things in Lava that we talk about a lot, and some of my movement students are here, they can attest, um, is we talk about effort. And human effort is just a word that we use to describe the qualities of human movement. Um, human movement efforts under Lava can really be described in four categories. They can be described by um, the amount of weight that you're giving to an element of, of movement or touch. So there can be, ooh, strong weight, there can be light weight. Um, there's your spatial intent for movement, so I can be very direct, or right now, I can be very indirect with my intention, right? So I can do something very directly or something very indirectly. Um, obviously there's time, so I can do something very quickly where I could sustain that moment of movement. And there's um, flow, so I could be very controlled with my movement, or I could let the movement take me. I could be very free, right? So I could be very bound, or I could be very free. My question when I was um, investigating the Playtron was, could we give those elements sound? Would there be different qualities of sound that would emerge as we played with these different um, ideas? So is there a specific type of sound for being direct versus indirect? Um, and as we think about movement, of course, touch comes of all. So if I touch somebody very directly, what we found was that that had a very different quality of sound versus touching somebody indirectly. If I touch somebody quickly, um, that would have a very different quality of sound, of course, than touching somebody in a very sustained manner, really letting my hand linger on somebody's shoulder or on somebody's hand. Um, and, and same with weight, you know, the Playtron especially, or the Touch Me, is very sensitive to pressure. Pressure changes the pitch. 
And so something that was very exciting was that, yeah, the, the more pressure I would give um, or somebody would give me when they touched me would really change the tone. So if somebody was combining this into a sustained, uh, strong weight touch, it would create this really, really distinct tone that was very different than a light, indirect, um, free touch, so to speak. So that was something that we found to be very rich, was the combination of Laban um, movement efforts with the touch me devices. So that these concepts that feel a bit intellectual um, were able to not only be embodied, um, but also to be heard. And I found that to be a very useful thing that I found in our technique. And the students used those Laban prompts to create full stories. Um, so they would use, you know, strong weight, lightweight, indirect, direct, to create short narrative nonverbal pieces that we could hear and experience um, kinesthetically. So we found that to be a really interesting finding. And I think that this would be of use in a Laban classroom, um, if especially somebody's looking for other ways besides just, you know, the kinesthetic experience of of it to be able to hear those efforts as well um, is is a potential application of this work. Uh, I'm going to pass things off to Amber to talk about her thesis more. Uh, the myth, the legend, Amber <laughs> Wright. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to say. Uh, Hi, my name is Amber. Uh, what I need right now, because that is what this program has taught me, is I need a collective breath. So I'm going to take one. I offer that to you all as well, because I'm. Whew, that was very. I was very stimulated since yeah. I with this. So I'm just going to. Uh, so I am in my third and final year of this graduate program. Uh, the growth is unbelievable. Uh, sorry, sometimes it goes away. My thesis. So when I got into this program, I knew I loved acting, I knew I loved teaching, and how do I combine the two, and then I found this program. But I didn't really know where, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to approach it, what I wanted to teach and explore. And in my first year in Stacy's class, um, I was given a book called, uh, oh my gosh, I lost it, Sensing Shakespeare, <laughs> Teaching Through Neurodiversity. Uh, and if you don't know what neurodiversity is, it's um, individuals on that have a neurological difference, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, and I immediately took to it uh, because I am part of that neurodiverse community with ADHD. And I kind of just hit the ground running with everything uh, everywhere all at once. <laughs> um, and found myself called to multi-sensory experiences and just exploring all of these different approaches and so I like to say that kind of my pedagogy in a way led me to a neurodiverse approach to acting and so through that came this I kept com coming back to the senses and the childlike play of it all because to me acting is storytelling and so it was interesting coming up with this thesis uh, which is acting through the senses, I'm sorry. And some of my students are here, hi. And so I wanted to explore acting through the senses, essentially, uh, because that's how I act. I, I, I start physically and let that, and sensorily, and let that move me into an emotional state. And I was curious to explore that. But before that, I found this wonderful project and I said, I'm game, I'll, I don't know what to expect, but it seems interesting, and we had that pre-question interview, and a few of the exercises that were mentioned, um, which I'll speak about, we, were um, profound, and overwhelming, and raw, sorry if I get emotional. Uh, the first one being, the touch me? Yeah, um, so I was paired up with someone and we were offered to tell a story uh, through touch and I think we actually found a light as well. I remember putting a light 
and me and my partner had established, we both held uh, the, the touch me, and we told the story of a daughter and a mom um, based off of the different sounds and uh, the pressure points and the way that we held and the sound that it made and this journey of this mom and this daughter from you know infant to fighting to essentially the goodbyes and the circle of life moment and so that was already a lot. I was like, oh, this is just the first exercise. <laughs> I wonder what the next one's going to be. Which led me to this full, overwhelming experience of um, the, I forget the name, sorry. What was uh, the second one? Oh, the, the Playtron. The Playtron. I didn't get that. Playtron. <laughs> <laughs> Playtron. <laughs> um, so none of us knew what to experience. We were asked to step out. And then we walked in, and I said, just, just keep an open mind, just keep an open mind. And so there were these metal tin things. And they were cookie sheets. Cookie <laughs> sheets, yes. And so I was like, okay, and they're like, take your shoes off and just step on them. And I was like, okay. And immediately, not knowing what to expect, the minute I stepped on the cookie sheet, bare feet, raw, I instantly heard someone's experience um, of the, their experience living through this pandemic. And I felt like I was, I felt icky at first, because I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm like invading this mm. private space. But I also felt like this is what it feels like to step into someone else's shoes, to step into someone else's life and to experience it with touch and hear it and even see it, you know, because it's just cookie sheets, <laughs> was so raw and so profound and moved me in a way that I was so overwhelmed that I cried throughout the entire thing of going and probably were like, why is she crying? <laughs> um, but it was beautiful and it was so captivating. I'm like, man, just through sound and touch and integrating both of these, and then the last one, which I will say was just as beautiful, which you, I, I'm excited for you all to experience, um, was we were all asked prior to that to send sounds of, and, and things that we think about when we think about the pandemic. And so some of us held hands, some of us didn't experience individually, uh, but when we would touch an item, we would hear a sound, and sometimes it was coughing, which was very triggering for some. Sometimes it was breath. Um, and so, again, to experience like, oh, these are not just what I sent in, but what other people sent in, and the things that they hear that might trigger them in some way, and, and that emotional response, I think, solidified, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to explore, essentially, and what I'm doing. And so in my classes, uh, as my students will attest to, we're just taking it day by day with each sense and exploring what it means like to just stare at something <laughs> and find meaning through it. And, you know, we haven't moved into it yet, but to touch with our fingertips and to listen and what that does to us what that physically does to us to inhibit and um, recreate an emotional response. Um, so that's essentially my thesis and uh, thank you, all three of you, for allowing me to be a part of that because it changed the way that I saw theater and what I believe that theater could become with this and that acting essentially is storytelling with the senses. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we should do a demo. Let's do a demo. Sure. Yeah. Amber, do you want a demo? Yeah. Sure. All right. So here we go. Oh, this is great. So oh, I can talk. Now you'll actually see what I was talking about about this love on business. So, touch me.
Very simple device. And after we demo, at the end, we'll be able to let other people play with this too, right, Stacey? Yeah. So, two people hold on to each end, and then we have to close the loop. <laughs> so, I'm um, talking about pressure, talking about weight. I'm going to touch Amber with very light weight. Now, I'm going to touch Amber with some strong weight. <laughs> you can play with speed. And of course, you can be very controlled with your touch. Or very free with your touch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can be very direct. <laughs> and you can be very indirect. So, isn't this fun? So, with just those ingredients, you can create all sorts of music. And when Amber was describing the story that they told of the mother and daughter just with hands, we could hear that relationship as it changed as much as we could see it. And they used just their hands. It was really powerful. Um, that between this, in this relationship, they created a song that changed as the relationship changed. <laughs> <laughs> things we heard from our participants was that this was an experience of collective processing of grief, of trauma, of joy, and of togetherness. That it felt like a time capsule for 2020. They reminded us that we had also experienced the Me Too movement concurrently. And so for many folks, there was a hypervigilance around touch. Some of us experienced an absence of touch. And many of us experienced wearing gloves a lot of the time. And so the experiences Amber pointed out can bring up a range of emotions and sensations. And so as we move forward tonight with Q&A and with demonstration, I just invite you per trauma-informed pedagogy to choose the path that feels like it honors your needs today. So if something triggers you in the wrong way, is that cool? Yeah. But if you want to lean in and test out any of our devices, you are welcome to do so. So. Before we go any further, we'd love to hear what questions you have at this point. <laughs> yes. Yes, how do you set, like that was set for piano. Mm. You yes. just decide if you want it to sound like a horn or a piano or a string instrument? They have, so the Platronica group has um, a couple different synthesizers, different like MIDI interfaces that you can choose. Um, and so, and they're all kind of different and now there's kind of a paywall so there's a couple free <laughs> ones and there's a bunch you can of pay for. Um, but you just you can use it really kind of with any synthesizer so if you have some kind of synthesizer you can set up for horns or whatever then you can you can set it up for that. Can you choose a different one that you're doing? Oh I was going to say we used um, play, on Playtronica's site they have four free synthesizers so it's synth.playtronica.com uh, Christine and I played with all of the options. Oh, we did. <laughs> and they arrange any kind of sound you could want, from uh, single instruments to voices to uh, strange space sounds. Strange space sounds. <laughs> so the possibilities are unlimited for what sound you could connect. Whole orchestras, even. True. Yeah. <laughs> I was suddenly given a microphone, so Sorry. I was <laughs> So these back here for demonstration, are they set to different instruments? They are not. They are set to uh, different sounds that the, uh, the students sent us relating to the pandemic. So they're sound clips. How did you build sound that clips. into? Um, I use a program called QLab, which we use in theater all the time to run our productions. Um, and so once I figured out I could set up a Q list in QLab and have each sound triggered by the object um, and then set a stop cue so when you stop touching it it stops playing that sound um, it's, it's kind of how it's set up i know it just sounds like super confusing right. but no no, no. <laughs> yeah. yes please jamie okay, hope we can like the mic. 
Oh, this is so much fun. Um, it, this is sort of a follow-up question, I guess, because I noticed during the demo that there was also like a little visual animation that was accompanying the movement. And so yeah, some of them is that those. also, that's also a default for the program and for the app, but does it also, it seems like there's also potential applications for then other color and movement and mm -hmm. kind of a visual aspect to it, but that's the default for the... They have, the different synths have different little like video things that'll okay. play. And like this, that one that you're hearing, we were trying it before and it wasn't working, you have to press record. And then it will record that pattern. And so you can watch it back and listen to it with the sounds you were making, which is just kind of a fun thing, you know, a fun extra that they have. Thanks. I love this. And I'm, I don't need the mic, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so the word synthesis and it reminds me of like synth synth can't say the word synthesizer moog synthesizer is that have anything to do with like because that's sound too is moog synthesizer and computers is that yeah. any relation or I mean it, yes it is I mean a moog synthesizer is a synthesizer um, but the 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 devices are just little MIDI devices, right? So they're just taking a signal and turning it into a sound. What that sound is depends on what you set up on the computer, right? So you like, say you were saying, it could be an orchestral sound, it can be, you know, beeps and boops. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the it alternate is. title for yeah, this yeah. project. <laughs> <laughs> beeps and boops was our ultimate title. <laughs> This is so exciting. Thank you. And thank you that you allowed your hunger and thirst to find water and bring us that water. There are many conduits here, and I love that you played with um, how the water could be channeled. Um, very exciting possibilities. And I'm making some connections with liturgy whether it's Jewish liturgy or Catholic, you know, if you come into a bounded language that's like a house, and you, whether for me, you know, the sign of the cross of water, there's the touch, the hearing, speaking, the tasting, um, and that was so lost during COVID. People, you know, I just found the screen just wasn't doing it. So this seems like a wonderful possibility for a conduit of the electricity that we feel with strangers, but we know they're all hungry and thirsty too. That's why we found it together. So thank you for opening that window, a possibility for us. Thank you. Have you thought about using it for worship or? Um, we have not discussed that at this point, no. Oh, but okay. Well, now I am. Yeah. <laughs> you are now. And what we're hoping is when you test today or as ideas emerge, maybe you'll leave us your thoughts. Um, we purchased the devices through the support of Dean Alexander and the CFA. So we now own, the university owns these. And so if you have a dream for what they can do, <laughs> they are available to you. <laughs> I actually have a question, kind of like along the same lines of, I love theater, but I'm actually wondering about the applications beyond far beyond theater, like I'm sure you've shared news about this with your friends and colleagues. So for example, like I could imagine app applications of music therapy and art therapy, mm -hmm. right? But I was just wondering if like, any of you have thought about like applications far beyond theater, what those ap applications would be. I mean, I think the thing that we've, we've talked about the most, and it kind of relates to the sculpture that's in the back, um, is trying to create what we, what we would like to see, I think, is some kind of art installation, because I feel like it works really well as an art installation mm -hmm. piece, where it's something you're going through like a museum, and as you touch different objects, you hear different sounds associated with those mm -hmm. objects, whether the ones that we have set up or the ones, the responses, right? We talked about a, a way that maybe you record how you felt during the pandemic as part of the installation, and then other people are hearing those, um, you know, those thoughts as they're getting to the end of the installation, right? Uh, libraries do exhibitions too, so that's Advocacy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love a museum where you get to actually touch things. Uh -huh. They usually yell at you yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, we do. Um, so just to clarify, I think this is really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, so the device itself... The device itself is a MIDI controller. Mm -hmm. 
um, and it doesn't require to be plugged in in order for the computer to receive signal. It does have a little USB plug-in. A USB-C? Yep, mm -hmm. USB-C okay. that goes right into your computer. Okay, so you can, you said it could work with a synthesizer, mm -hmm. like an actual, like a mobile. I think, yeah, I think you, I mean, you, right now, the computer interface is, I think, how you have to do it. Um, but I, that's a good question. I don't know how, if, if that would, I think if you had the right adapter, it could. Yeah, so you're saying that if it, if it plugs right into the computer, then any sound library that you have or any digital audio workstation you have, it just works as... Just like a regular MIDI controller. Perfect. That's all it really is, is a MIDI controller. It just has the copper elements so that you can use physical touch right. to create a system. Or, yeah, yeah. And Playtronica doesn't require that you have its own downloadable software in order to run? To the run the, to the, the synths that are online for it are, we've just used the Playtronica ones. We haven't experimented past that because we, we jumped right to... Like I said, I have a QLab program that would set up sounds and it would play those sounds. So the sculpture in the back plays sounds that we created or the, the students sent to us and that we programmed to play when you touch on the instruments. Okay, thank you. I intuit in your question that there are a lot of possibilities for electronic music making. The devices are also being used in elementary music education pretty oh. ubiquitously, which is really exciting. And uh, the research branch of Playtronica is also exploring how this might be a tool in special education, which is, mm. uh, I think, the next wave. Yeah, it's cool. Yes, do you know Well, I, I just love this project for so many reasons. <laughs> and Stacey, I love this last piece that you just said, right, about special education, right? And I want to link it back to something that I think we're seeing. Am I good? You're good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Um, and I think that Christine said something, and I can't possibly capture how wonderful you said it, but there's this piece in this project that I love about uh, a form of, it's not translation, but it's a moment of illuminating the possible, mm -hmm. right? Between this notion of sort of the felt, emotional, embodied, this moment of making it or moving it into a kind of technical, intellectual, you know, kind of realm. But I'm more interested in that in-between space, mm -hmm. that space of interpretation, that space of sharing, that space of possibilizing the, the ineffable, that which is, is unarticulate in some yes. ways, but the ways in which we can gain access to each other, particularly that example of the mother-daughter, that cycle of life thing, and that music that emerges in the middle, right? That, that we can't quite articulate. We can feel it sometimes mm -hmm. in relationships, but this gives it a very outwardly, outward manifestation of that thing that we can ponder on in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why I also love this link to liturgy, mm -hmm. right? right? That articulate, the articulation of faith, of belief, of ritual, of communal uh, engagement in ways that I think uh, only the devout, in some ways, within a religious ceremony can feel that thing hovering within a religious space that's not within the words, that's not exclusively in the sort of um, uh, ritual acts, right? But it's in the in-betweenness, you know, of being in belief, right, and feeling that. Right? And so I just love, God, I love this project. I love this project for so many reasons, even though Jason is a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Because I usually don't like what Jason does. <laughs> Except for the Acropolis exhibit. Yeah, yeah. Very fabulous. <laughs> mm -hmm. I appreciate that so much. Um, our sort of sequence of development as creatives is wow. Ow. <laughs> 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 and what now? And so we've been living in a state of possibility, potential for what could be, and what has been thrilling for us is to be in a state of interbeing again, and to be in conversation about how we've all been changed in, where did my friend go? It was three years, we're just saying, John said oh, it's been three years yeah. this week mm -hmm. since it was, um, 
to declare begin the first case of COVID. So, first case. Wow. so much has happened and there is so much to process. Art is only one mechanism for us to do that, but for us it is the language that we know and the language that we hope to continue conversation with you. Right. One more question here, please. Right, so Amber, you said that you walked in the lab, took off your shoes, <laughs> put on a cookie sheet, and <laughs> made music. Yeah, so I, when I stepped on the cookie sheet, I immediately heard someone else's experience of what they went through during this pandemic, how they felt about it. Okay, well, were you holding on to one of these devices when you did it, or? Oh, yes. Okay, so um, let's say, is, does that change from person to person? Would the sound that Amber makes standing on the plant on the pan be different from like a five-year-old child or you know who has a completely different body type or maybe difference in body chemistry or things like that thank you for asking that question there's another question like that we get asked a lot when we mm -hmm. present about this work is does how you feel change how you say yeah, yeah, yeah you too yeah. <laughs> whole time like a mood ring. <laughs> yeah. alas there are limits to this technology <laughs> so it is currently finite and in this approach um each cookie sheet was attached or connected to a specific yeah. textual recorded response so amber stepped into one holding the thing and it would play a particular voice yeah. sound mm -hmm. Uh, somebody else would step in, it would play that same thing. But we would step over to a different cookie sheet. Yeah. <laughs> Just this frizzled for you. And we'd step over here, and a different um, thing would be cute. We were real, okay, listen, I have to defend the cookie sheets. If we were thinking about wouldn't it be cool if you could make a conductive floor? that you didn't necessarily see where one thing would end and another mm -hmm. would begin. I learned how they did it. Ah! So there, is oh, a, yeah, yeah. there is a very cool project. Uh, it's a human installation where there is a group of people who are standing in a sort of squared cluster. They're all wearing Crocs, which apparently are cool again. And they put conductive tape on the bottom of Whoa. their shoes. <laughs> so then you could move through as an audience member, and each different person you touch would create a different sound based on pressure and duration. And that's why Crocs are cool again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, would, I would say, though, if, if in that case, in the cookie sheet phase, um, <laughs> if it was set up to the touch me and not the play drawn, then That's I think true. a different sensation, a different person um, would create more of a sound that, that the touch me creates. Whereas the play drawn, a, a specific instrument is connected to a specific note, yeah. right? So it, it would maybe do that if we had it set up that way. Yeah, you could do something like because touch me is response to pressure. So yes, right. like water, presumably if a five-year-old stood on it, it would make a different sound than if I did. Correct. Yeah. Last thought, Jamie, and then we're going to move into testing in our final twenty minutes. And this is just a follow-up to Kevin's question because I was trying to maybe this is helpful for all of us. I'm trying to visualize how the logistics of phase two worked. Was it so? So was it and then all of those participants walking around simultaneously and different no, sort of like a company or one very person at a time? A really good okay. question because. We, the same thing with the installation of the back. It to avoid, we could have done it if two people had controllers. They were stepping on that we'd be hearing two things at the same time. You get this kind of cacophony of sounds that didn't really make it conducive to what we were trying to do. So the same thing with the sculpture in the back. It's a kind of one person at a time, one thing at a time. And when you let go, it will stop playing that sound. Now you can make the connection five, ten people. If everybody's holding on, the last person touches it, you're all going to hear that sound together. But we, did, we don't have a situation where like one person could be playing the pot and another person could be playing this thing because it would be too many things happening yeah. at the same okay. time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we, we sort of had folks assemble outside the room and said we're going to go into this next phase and one at a time they came mm -hmm. in. Right, which was kind of important because it was nice to have them alone in the room with the, the pandemic thought sound playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to make one comment. I thought it was a ticklish moment, absolutely ticklish moment, when Amber's voice triggered Siri on her. Yeah. I thought, how perfect. Yeah. Happens more than you realize. Before we wrap up, I just want to remind if we have any honor students today.
please get your Good. name on our paper so you will get credit. <laughs> Thank you. Really, really. <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> yes, if you want to pay more, there is a promo code. But again, we have six of the devices so far. One hooked up in the back for Playtron and our Museum of Pandemic Objects and Sounds. Help yourself. Jason will be back there to assist. If you would like to try to touch me, Christine and Amber will be up here. And if you have questions, ask any of us or go write your thoughts on the board. Thank you for being with us.